Um, it's about, uh, well, towards the end of last year, I was suffering some form of malaise, and I eventually self-diagnosed my problem is uh, I've been thinking too much. Um, my day job requires a lot of thinking. You know, OpenStack tends to do that to people. Um, and my downtime had thinking of its own, various backlog of home projects, brewing and 3D printing and renovations and whatnot. I just, I just needed to dial it back a bit. Um, you know, and even when I was you know, on the Twitter feed, I was you know, contemplating the consequences of a Trump presidency or <laughs> whatever else was lurking in my feed that was just horrible. Um, so I decided I needed a new hobby. And uh, I had some criteria for this hobby. It has to be something which requires less problem-solving thinking, no coding, no soldering, no making, just learn a new skill, nice hobby thing. Um, and eventually what I came up with is that I really should get back into learning a musical instrument. And I decided on an electric guitar. Um, back in the day, um, at school, I self-taught and I hacked away with you know, precisely uh, zero technique and precision and no teaching. Did that for a few years, um, moved on to electronic music at university, you know, had a good old time making jungle and drum and bass. Uh, finally got a real job where I spent all day sitting in a chair in front of a computer and suddenly found that going home and sitting on a chair in front of a computer to make music was really not uh, even remotely uh, enticing. So I dropped the whole lot and haven't done anything else for the last 20 years. Um, but it seemed like a good thing to get back into, um, except this time I was going to do it right. I was going to get an instrument that was of sufficient quality to actually be enjoyable playing and would make a nice sound. Um, I'd really apply myself to actually uh, learning it, um, and the resources these days for learning music is, are just phenomenal. You know, even YouTube aside, you know, the just books and you know whatnot. It's, it's it's a great time to pick up a, an instrument to do anything, and it's something I would thoroughly thoroughly recommend. You know, we're all tend to be quite techy people, and we assume that the key to being better at techy things is to do more techy things, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just to have a more balanced life, and having a crea creative output is you know, often very good at that sort of thing. So if anyone else is teetering on the edge, I would thoroughly re recommend just giving something a go. But one of, the, one of the aspects of having an electric guitar that sounds good is that uh, it's, you need things further down the chain that actually make the sound. And that tends to be a collection of pedals. So, building up a collection of pedals is, you know, meant to be this process where, you know, every single pedal is carefully considered and really earns its way into the rack, and once it's in, it's, it's your, you know, dedicated thing for doing that particular task. Um, so you know it can take a while to get to get your uh, to get your perfect collection, and then once you have it, you you get this logistical challenge of you know how how is it going to be arranged, how you're going to wire it up. Um, you know this this looks looks lovely, but you know it, more often than not you end up with something looking like this. <coughs> so we have you know we have a layout problem, we have routing problems. Um, power and, and signal lines. Um, we have uh, these real-world world wires which limit the flexibility of how things can be arranged. And there's solutions to all of these, and you can end up with something like this. <laughs> but again, that's, that's very expensive and a lot of effort. And uh, if I did this, it would violate uh, no soldering, no making, and no problem solving of, of my uh, <laughs> hobby criteria. So I didn't really want to go down this path. So what I, ended up, what I ended up with is this thing. It's a Boss GT100 um, effects processor. Um, it has a bunch of effects. Well, I'll, I'll show you. So here's, here's a represent, representation of the pipeline that's inside it. It, it models uh, a series of you know, discrete effects boxes. Um, and it's, it's, it is very, it's, it's not a completely generic signal processing unit. It's very much focused on guitar-specific requirements. Um, so I don't know if you can see those um, codes up there, but you've got the usual. You've got a compressor, overdrive. Um, then it splits into two A and B paths, um, each one with its own dedicated preamp, so preamp A and B. And then it gets mixed together again. We've got graphics e uh, EQ, you know, delay, chorus, reverb, 
just the usual stuff. But if you see those um, on the left there, the FX1, and towards the right, FX2, um, they each uh, can be set to any one of a number of effects. Um, so what you end up with is basically every boss effects pedal ever um, in, a, in a pipeline where uh, you can reorder things at your whim um, and set any of the options at, uh, at the push of a button. But that's not all. Um, <laughs> Because what I really wanted, you know, I have some limitations in, in playing at home. You know, I've got a family, I've got a small house, I can't be cranking through a big amp. Um, and the amplifier is actually a really important part of the guitar sound. Um, there's things that happen when you overdrive a tube, a tube amp to the point where it's distorted. Um, tube distortion is very pleasant and part of the characteristic sounds of, of certain styles of music. Um, and this unit has the capability to model you know, a bunch of classic amps, you know, Fender Bass Man, um, you know, Marshall, Plexi. Um, incidentally, the Bass Man is terrible at playing bass, but to be fair, every single amp in the 50s was terrible at playing bass, so it wasn't their fault. Um, but that's not all. Um, another really important aspect of the guitar sound is what happens when it comes out of the speaker um, into, you know, either the ambient space or to be picked up by a microphone um, to go into the mixing desk. And microphone placement is an, a whole art form in it itself in a, in a big studio. Um, there's, you know, placement and brand of microphone can have a huge impact on the tone. Um, and the GT100 unit has the capability to simulate um, how many speakers you have in your cabinet, uh, what size the speakers are, whether it's an open or back cabinet, uh, what brand of microphone, uh, how far the microphone is away from the speaker, how offset it is from the center of the speaker. So all this is really rather compelling for me, um, especially when I'm you know, generally playing with headphones on. So there's a lot of parameters there, and you can control them all through the unit, um, but it's quite hard to get a big picture of what's going on in the patch. Um, there's um, proprietary software called Boss Tone Studio that works on Mac and PC. Um, I run Linux, uh, so it, it does actually work under Wine, except for the bit that actually sends the data to the unit. <laughs> um, almost works. <laughs> so um, my current on only option is to spin up a VM and, uh, and run it through that with some USB pass-through, and it works fine. But you know, it's not ideal. I would have quite liked some native tools to, to, to manage it myself. But here we can see, um, you can see the pipeline. Um, I can drag and drop those modules to change the order. Um, um, I can tweak the parameters. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's and also uh, it has a native um, patch exchange file format called TSL, Tone Studio Library, um, which is essentially a, a JSON file um, with you know, a, a collection of patches, um, and a patch itself is pretty much just a memory dump of this GUI, from what I can tell, um, which pretty much maps exactly to um, values in the, in the unit, um, with a bit of faffing around. So how does it talk to the unit? Well, we have this standard called MIDI. It's an, it's an old standard, but it's, it, it's hanging in there. Um, published in 83, um, Serial communication between musical instruments, you know, it, it really changed the, the landscape at the time. Um, that's a MIDI cable there, but, but these days it's all happening over USB, but it's still 31 kilobit. Um, it's a, it's a byte-based protocol, um, but the, unfortunately the data bytes only have access to um, seven bits of information, which when you're trying to transmit arbitrary binary data can be a limitation, but we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. So let's just um, have some really simple examples of, of some uh, MIDI uh, messages. Um, if my uh, right index finger emoji pushed the middle C button, um, what would happen is three bytes would be generated. Um, that note on message says eight means it's note on, zero means it's MIDI channel one. Um, then we have the code for middle C, that's the note on the, on the piano, on the keyboard. Even a full-size piano only has 88 keys, so the fact that we're limited to seven bits, um, which means 128 
um, possible values um, is, uh, is no problem in this case. Um, and then the third value is the velocity of, of the key press. And we're pushing it all the way down, so it's, um, the value is 127 there. So that's the maximum value you can fit into seven bits. Uh, another example, there's a control slider for various things. You know, probably to set the tremolo would be the, the, the standard thing. Um, again, we have a, a, a message, you know, B is the command, zero is the channel, um, uh, zero one is the which controller it is, and some arbitrary value. We also have a pitch bend. Now, pitch bend is interesting because y you can't really get away with um, 128 possible values in a, in a decent sounding pitch bend. It would sound terrible, especially over a large range like an octave or two. So they use uh, two bytes for this. So it, it gives us a maximum of you know, around 16,000, which is you know, much uh, more appropriate for this particular uh, control value. So that's, that's standard MIDI for actually playing music. Um, as, as far as transmitting patch data, it's a little bit more tricky because it's, you know, it's arbitrary data. It's very specific to this device. So it really needs a um, custom protocol to send it. Now MIDI has this other part of the spec called system exclusive messages. Um, and all of, the, all of the transmission and receiving of patches is done through sysx. Uh, messages that are essentially, um, please give me the value of this memory range, or here is some data, please plonk it in this memory location. Um, so, and that's what the Boss Tone Studio software does. So let's just take an example of setting the gain to 11 on a um, on the on the amp, and 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 follow it all the way through. So Boss publishes a spec. Um, which is you know reasonably helpful, which uh, which says how the how the system exclusive um, messages are are, are managed. Um, a very important part is is this this memory map where it, it tells you the the memory range of all the different values. Um, the interesting bit starts from the the, the user patch onwards, and if we carry on down to uh, 60, that's the location of the temporary patch which is where I can write things without overwriting any of the, the user patches. Um, so the, the device has 200 built-in patches. Um, a d disproportionate number seem to be heavy metal patches, but that's just my personal bias. I, I don't have anything against metalers. Um, and another 200 uh, for, the, for user patches, which if you write to that location, it will persist. Um, but the temporary patch is where you can just twiddle the knobs and um, it won't be written to anything unless you actually explicitly do it right to some other location. So further on in the spec, we have this uh, very large patch table um, where this address is the offset of your main patch. So it's, so it's temporary patch location plus that. Um, and we find, and, and it, it specifies what every single value maps to. So here we have a, a single byte um, for uh, the, the gain of preamp A, and it's on a range of 0 to 120. So setting it to 11 is not going to be a problem. Um, I generated a JSON spec file, which essentially has an entry for each one of those lines, um, which says its memory address. Um, that parameter key is what the Boston Studio file format uses to identify it, which is sort of different to anything in the spec. Um, and then it's, you know, it's got some other things like the lookup table at the top there. Um, all of these values have, have a corresponding lookup table, even if it's a straight one-to-one -one mapping between value and number, just because it's convenient and it's still fast enough to load at startup time, so it's not a big deal. Um, and yeah, finally, from your size, it's, it's a single byte, so that makes things simple. So let's build an actual system exclusive message. This time, um, it's a much bigger message than those other many messages we saw before. Um, because there might be a lot of devices in the chain, we have to say what brand we are, we have to say what model we are. So we're a Boss GT100, device zero, just in case I have a whole chain of them. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, and then we have, we're saying what command this is. In this case, it's a send command. And then I'm saying the address. 
and then the value, and yes, I know that's 11 hex, so it's not actually 11, but <laughs> yes, it's still funny. <laughs> Please laugh. <laughs> um, and finally, there's a checksum, which is uh, just the modulo of the important bits of the packet. So I wrote some software using Python, which um, was just a basic patch management send a patch, receive a patch, um, manage TSL files, um, sending, when I was specifically sending things, I've, I've tried a few approaches, but I found the best way of doing it was sending it one to, one to six message per parameter, and there's about 900 parameters, um, and it goes, f it goes fast enough for, for my needs. But receiving, that wouldn't work because each, each request is a round trip, say, give me this, thank you, give me this. Um, so that's much too slow. So I ended up um, batching it up into chunks of 128 bytes and then unpacking it on the client. Couldn't be more than 128 bytes because then we cross over into uh, the, the discontinuous space caused by the seven bits um, that we're limited to for addressing. So the address space is, is full of large gaps because um, it's impossible to represent those memory locations um, by uh, uh, when, you, when you're missing that extra bit. So there's a bit of translation um, to go to and from the seven bit number to a real number. Um, because this is a Python talk, let's have some Python. Um, turns out when I was pushing one parameter per request, not all the parameters were sticking. Um, problem went away when I did a one millisecond sleep between each push. Um, so okay, the the some parameters, the, the unit gets busy and it doesn't respond. Um, so it's just heck in our magic sleep. So it's like, you know, I'm talking arcane serial protocols and magic sleeps and you know, reading and writing from memory locations. This feels like real programming. <laughs> but no, but no, that's, that's, that's my old way of thinking. I, you know, all programming is real programming. And um, I'm learning to... Uh, unlearn my, uh, my uh, absorption of contempt culture. So uh, I retract that statement. <laughs> so anyway, to the subject of the actual talk. Now that I had this general tool, I had something which could be done with the GUI, um, but without the convenience of an actual GUI. So you know, it's not that profound. Um, so I started thinking, Okay, there's 900 parameters. There's you know, essentially an unlimited combination, which I'm never going to fully explore just by um, having sessions tweaking the knobs. So is there a more efficient way I could uh, fully explore the capabilities of this device? So I thought maybe I could just generate random pictures and listen to them all and see if something interesting comes out. Um, you know, at, at the very worst, in theory, nothing will come out, and, but that's okay. Um, so I decided, you know, if I was going to do this, how would it work? Um, I eventually came up with some different kinds of mutations that were possible. Um, you know, the simplest one is whether a particular module is turned off or on. So I'm starting out with a uh, completely plain um, patch set, nothing applied, very plain sound, defaults are sensible, um, and then applying a series of mutations on top of that, um, and then seeing what the result is. So once we've done the on, uh, uh, an on-off mutation, we can, for anyone which is enabled, we can reorder it in the pipeline. Um, I'm being careful about only making changes to things that are enabled, because you know, what if I come up with the perfect patch, and all, all it needs is a little bit of reverb, and I turn the reverb on, and it's, oh my god, it's, um, it's been destroyed by some previous mutation. So. Um, Keep it limited to things that are enabled. Uh, there are limitations on where things can go in the pipeline, so there's a, a bunch of validations that need to be applied. Um, for example, preamp A must stay in the A path, um, preamp B in the B path. Um, and there's some other limitations that I want to apply, like the, the NS1 next to preamp A, that's just a noise suppressor. Um, it's got to go somewhere it, next to the preamp is a good place to do it, because that's often where some buzz is generated. Um, I want, yeah, that's 
for ah oh, yeah, I, I don't really care about send return because I'm not plugged anything into it. Um, yeah, other than that, it's just is it a valid pipeline? And then finally, it's actually changing values uh, in in whatever's enabled. And let's say in FX1, they have the subtypes, and each of those subtypes have their own controls. So again, I'm only um, uh, throbbing the knobs for um, effects that are actually enabled. OK. Should we try and make some noise? OK, so the question is, how do I OK, generating the, the, the random patches is fine. I've got a tool. Um, it takes a, a, a plain patch from a TSL file and generates however many you tell it to uh, patches. It's, it's completely offline and doesn't need to be plugged into the, to the unit. And then I have a TSL full of um, patches with um, a specified number of mutations in them. So then how do I evaluate them? That's, that becomes a major problem. Um, I've gone with a couple of approaches. One is where I've, I've called it audition, where I've, I get a, a, a test um, file um, of guitar playing, um, load a patch, play the file, record the result, save the result to its own file, and then, and then go through the entire list. Um, that means I don't have to be there for the listening to every single thing, um, and I can come back later and, and, and go through the results. Um, another approach is to um, have a, a, an interactive session where you're applying small mutations, um, seeing the result. If it's, um, if it's good, you keep it. Um, if it's really good, you save it to a TSL file. Um, but if it's not good, you can back it out. Um, you can back it out all the way um, and then reapply. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's less mutations, more chance of getting something reasonable, possibly less chance of getting something amazing. So, I forgot to mention, um, while I'm learning the guitar, I'm still actually terrible. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I needed to come up with the, the, the perfect um, test sample. I needed to have everything. I needed to have single notes. I needed to have uh, intervals, triplets, arpeggios, um, chords, power chords, open chords. Um, oh, and it needed to be short. Um, <laughs> So this is what I came up with. Um, it's still 17 seconds long, which I think is too long. Um, but uh, so we're gonna make sound. There we go. OK, that was, that was with an actual pleasant effect on it. And this is what it sounds like dry. So, so straight off um, the guitar into the mixing desk. Um, no effects whatsoever. Different take as well. It sounds quite different. I don't think that distortion is on the actual recording. OK, this is going to loop. Let's shut that up. Um, okay, so generated a bunch of patches, um, loaded them into Tone Studio just to show what it looks like. Um, see, down the left here is um, the 100 patches. Um, if I hover over it, I've populated the note field with um, a summary of what the mutations are. Um, so you can see what's happened. The FX2 has been turned on. It's been turned into a rotary uh, effect. Um, um, the order's been mucked about with. Uh, compressors on as well. Uh, FX1 is a phaser. Um, so yeah, so let's let's just see what happens. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, that sounds okay. Um, it 
that's interesting. Let's see what's actually happening in that patch. Um, okay, so here we've got um, not a lot enabled. There's a compressor, um, EQ, and FX2 is uh, a rotary rotary effect. Ah, now this is interesting. This is a, a sort of classic um, old school effect, which is a speaker mounted on a motor that spins around with a microphone <laughs> pointing at it. And when the speaker goes past the microphone, it's louder. And there's, so there's a tremolo effect as the speaker goes around, and there's probably um, a Doppler shift effect as, as, it, as it sweeps past. So you get this nice tremolo vibrato plus the acoustic characteristics of the speaker and the mic and the whatever box it's in. So it's, you know, cool to have a simulation of that. Um, <laughs> so what else is going on here? Um, EQ, um, when I disabled the EQ, the sound was a lot fuller, but it's, so it's actually taking away some of the bottom end and some of the top end. Um, it's actually quite nice, you know, it's, it's kind of sort of tinny retro sound. So it's, it's a good example of um, often it's the things you take away from, from the sound that, that make it interesting rather than the things you add to it. Um, okay, I'll skip 4A because the um, screenshot's not that great. Well, it sounds terrible. It sounds bad. That's why I called it bad. I'll play it. <laughs> Like ABC metal plus extra, plus extra stuff. I don't know what's going on. Okay, let's try this one. Okay. <laughs> what's going on here? It does sound like a pipe organ. Okay, so it's all happening at the end of the chain here. So FX2 is a pitch shifter, and it's being um, pitch shifted by 24 semitones. So that's two octaves, two octaves higher. Um, that's why it's so squeaky. Um, then there's a delay, and then there's a chorus. So that's just going to be muddying things up a bit. Um, and then there's a reverb. Um, so the thing about the pitch shifter is that it, it, models, it models a note, processes it, and you know, does what you tell it to. Um, the, the key word being there, a note. Um, as soon as you start playing two notes or chords, um, th things start getting weird. Um, so you just don't do that. So, so it sort of holds it together for the first bit, but as, as the chords come in, it just falls apart. Um, the, the chorus is probably, the settings for the chorus is probably giving it that sort of tinny tone as well. And weirdly, it's, it's put in the Excel FX. Um, there was an extra, there's a, there's a switch which you can toggle to do things when you when you push it, um, and this one it's it's um, assigned it to the ring modulator. So the ring modulator has a carrier tone. In this case, it's 70 hertz, which it multiplies with the original sound, and the result is completely atonal, basically never musical. Um, you don't actually hear it on that, but um, but if if you uh, I had a play when you push it, and things get very interesting, <laughs> as if they weren't enough already. So anyway, that's just an example of a, of a reasonably good patch and, and just a horrendous patch. Most of them, you know, with the high mutation rate, like that, that was generated with 40 mutations. Um, at that rate, you know, a good proportion of them are silent. Um, but you know, I could weed a lot of those out with um, just by um, seeing how loud it is in the, in the processing before I saved it out. And if it's not, if it's not playing anything, then I, c I can just skip it. Um, so... Oh no, we're not done. We're not done. Um, here's a session with another tool. No, hang on. Okay. So here's an interact interactive session with the um, with the mutate command. Um, so here's my. Oh, I wish that would go away. Here is uh, the tool itself. Um, so you've got these send, rec send receive commands, um, the rand command which generated that file with 100 patches, the audition command which we've just been listening to the results of. Um, there's a sort command which just takes takes a TSL file input, um, has a bunch of TSL file outputs, loads each patch, and then prompts to say which one you want to put it into, whether it's the reject one or the interesting one or the listen to later one. So now we're going to listen to the mutate uh, command. <laughs> Okay, it started out with some random patch, so we're going to use the send command to set it to the neutral one. Mm. 
Okay, I'll just quickly see here. I can choose how many mutations um, per per mutate um, it will apply. Um, this one's a lot lower than the other one because we're doing small mutations, um, and which we can back out if they if they don't go anywhere. Um, and there's um, some ways of saying what kind of mutations you would rather have. Um, so we have a relative weighting of whether it's enable reorder value. And finally, we can uh, limit it to specific uh, effects. So what I'll probably end up doing is um, running a, having a mutate session where I'm only changing FX1 and FX2, or I'm only changing the preamp and the speaker and the mic setup so I can you know, just explore those areas. Um, but, but here we're just uh, doing a whole lot. <laughs> So you can see the patch name. I'm generating a random patch name. The challenge was I'd like it to be readable. Um, it has to fit in two blocks of eight. And ideally, it doesn't have any accidental squares or insult any deities. <laughs> so, so I came up with this consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel setup, and it seems to work pretty well. Okay, this goes on for a while. Let's just skip ahead. Um, okay, we're scrolling up here just to see that stuff that's falling off the top. It's just showing what the mutations actually were. And here we've got an ASCII art representation of, of, the, um, of the pipeline just to give you an idea of what the reorder mutations have done. see a lot of the time the mutations actually result in the volume going down. It's quite quiet, isn't it? And you can do this indefinitely. Um, so Next steps, um, you might have seen there was a, some to-do messages, um, to-do mutate assign. Um, there's, a, there's actually another thing this, um, this unit can do. Um, there's a, an expression pedal, which is generally used for you know, either volume when it's disabled or um, you know, wah, the classic guitar wah effect. Um, but you can actually assign that pedal to any any number of well yeah up to eight parameters in a uh, in a patch. Um, what if what if the choice of those assignments was actually part of the mutations? Um, and you know this is where things get really interesting because you know a good proportion of the parameters really were not designed to be modulated with a pedal. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe maybe some of those um, will still make an interesting sound. Um, so th this is a little bit more effort because, uh, like, say when mutate's fine, I can just sit there and, and you know, play the, push the pedal as I'm playing. But with Audition, I want to be sending some MIDI controller values to, you know, simulate, say, a triangle wave of, of the pedal going up and down. Um, but I think, you know, there's potential of a, uh, creating a whole different element of, um, of uh, new sounds. Um, so the other thing I'm trying to work out is, you know, I could easily generate a thousand patches. You know, maybe there's a fantastic one in there. I really don't want to sit through uh, every one to find it. So how can I, uh, how can I do a better job of categorizing all these patches? Um, you know, it's, it's, it gets really fatiguing. It's quite awful. You know, I would. I would I would pay someone to listen to these um, and <laughs> tell me what was good. So hang on, what if I actually paid someone to listen to listen to these? Um, so one option is to um, go to a mechanical turking platform and you know upload all these samples, um, prompt them for some questions. You know, do you find this interesting? Do you find do you think this sounds good? Um, you know, there's some really interesting potentials there. Like, um, sorry, I, I'm I'm jumping ahead. Do people know what, what mechanical turking is? Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 
It's a using online platform to, um, to set up micro tasks that people actually get paid for. And you know, cynical me says these are you know, generally either spam filtering or spam generation, but you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's, there's real work going on there somewhere. Um, but if, you know, and, and th there's going to be cultural biases about what, what, what people think sounds good or not, and you know, wouldn't it be interesting to, um, to actually be able to capture that and go, oh, okay. Um, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a group here that, that have some very interesting ideas. I wouldn't hear this otherwise. Um, and then once I've got a decent corpus of, of responses, you know, maybe that can be used as a uh, training data set for some machine learning. Um, maybe the machine learning couldn't tell you what's good, but it could tell you what's boring, and that would filter out a whole bunch of stuff that you wouldn't have to listen to yourself. Um, so Python libraries used um, to, to implement this. Um, Python RT MIDI was low-level communication um, with MIDI devices. Sitting on top of that is a library called Mido. It's really nice if you're going to do any MIDI programming in Python. Um, it has a really nice um, object model of, of MIDI messages and also has a model for, um, for, for, for ports to, to read and write from. Um, you can do it blocking or async. This, it's it's um, quite lovely. For the audition um, command, I needed to load a WAV file, um, play it, uh, while recording simultaneously and then saving the results. Um, the sound device library had a, a nice simple API for um, playing and recording that was sitting on top of port audio. Um, I say it's nice, it does tend to crash after about 50 patches, so I lied. There wasn't 100 in the result, there was only about 54 because it core dumped. But um, let's say it's not sound device's fault, let's say it's port audio's fault. Um, um, sound device and WAV file both generate NumPy arrays, but they're in a sli slightly different format, so I just use NumPy to, to transpose it, but I've switched from one to the other. Um, Cliff is a nice wee tool. It came out of um, um, the one of the very many libraries that Doug Hellman um, has written. Um, it's, it's a way of quickly putting together um, command line interfaces, um, and it gives you a, an entry point mechanism where you can register a subcommand uh, just by setting an entry point in any arbitrary Python project. Um, this means that I can have my main patch management tool called Bogged, um, but I don't have to put this, the, the random generation commands in the same tool, because that's a general purpose tool, and these random commands are, you know, it's a relatively specialized thing. So I have that in a separate repo, but, um, but when I run it, it's all the commands are under a single, single uh, main command, so it's quite nice. And then finally, I wanted a, uh, a prompt-driven user interface where it's asking a question, and you enter the answer, which might be multiple choice, might be text, might be any number of types. Um, and I found Inquirer was, was you know, of, of the many options, um, it was one that met, met my needs. Um, so it was quite nice. Um, the code is there. So really not that much Python at all to get to, to, to do that. I was quite happy with um, how they ended up. Um, spec generation code, you're never going to see that. Don't ask about it. it, it it's horrible. Um, but the rest is all up on GitHub. Um, but if, if we go back to my original uh, criteria for learning my new hobby, um, you know, so it's just <laughs> complete fail. You know, things kind of escalated after I, um, after I uh, put in a submission for this, for this talk. Um, <laughs> so all I can say is, you ruined my hobby, Tommy Richards. You ruined my... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, any questions? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> what did you need to solder? Ah, uh, ah, uh, <laughs> just, just cables, because... Actually, getting a getting a loop from the laptop, playing sound through the device with my very limited mixing desk means back into the laptop was slightly convoluted. So, cables, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've w I'm wondering if you've uh, played with any like genetic algorithms or anything like that to try to. Yeah, um, I, I, I thought about it because I have done a little bit of genetic algorithm. Actually, you know, sort of ten years ago at LCA, I did a lightning talk on label placement with genetic al algorithms. Um, 
and my conclusion was it's a terrible solution for basically anything. Um, <laughs> but but I do have hope for machine learning and so you know a lot of the new frameworks. If, if someone has, if someone says okay, comes up to me and says use this framework, do this stuff. Um, if if you've got a uh, some training data and a bunch of samples that you want to categorize, um, please hit me up after the talk in the hallway because I'd be, you know, some guidance would be would be useful. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Are you ready? Thank you.